Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for joining us this evening um, at, for this discussion, or this lecture, actually, by uh, Lloyd Jones. Um, I'm Julianne Schultz, the editor of Griffith Review, and it's been my great pleasure to work with Lloyd on, on this current edition, Pacific Highways, and to have the opportunity to welcome him this evening to give an address on what to write about, um, and what not to do when standing on a lectern that's got wheels. <laughs> Don't lean on it. Um, um, before I start, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners and their elders past and present. Um, and to, to put this into a context um, of what we're discussing, uh, what Lloyd's going to talk about is what to write about, um, which is the, the eternal challenge, I guess. Um, but Lloyd is particularly well placed to be able to address address this question. I mean, the author, I asked him how many books he's written, and he said, I refuse to count. Um, but there's a lot of them. Um, most recently, his memoir, The History of Silence, uh, which is a reconstruction of his family, but uh, in the sort of wake of the of the Christchurch earthquake. It's a very, very moving, very moving book, which has just been getting great reviews internationally, um, he was saying today. Um, his most, I guess, most well-known for his novel, Mr Pip, uh, which won the Commonwealth Prize a few years ago and was recently made into a film um, and has formed the basis now for a wonderful project that he's involved in, which is building a library and creating a library on, in Bougainville. Um, so the sort of the circle goes on. Um, one of my personal favourites is his book called Hand Me Down World, which is a story about a refugee woman in Europe um, and I think it's it's a marvellous piece to read and in our context in this country at this time when we're sort of still struggling to know how to deal with the whole sort of refugee question this takes you to an emotional space which is really remarkable in that in that sort of issue that's besetting the world and his book the book of fame um, about the uh, a very early Eng uh, New Zealand rugby tour of, of England which um, is still one of the books that many people use to get young boys to start reading because it's a book about rugby and uh, um, has a life which just goes on. So I'm not going to say anything much more. Um, Lloyd's going to address, you, address this question and then we'll have a conversation after, after he's completed. So please join with me in welcoming Lloyd-Jones. Thank you. Thank you, Julian. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thanks to the State Library for hosting this event tonight, and uh, Griffith University, and of course uh, Griffith Review. Um, this, this invitation to, to give a lecture or a talk, um, which I seldom do by the way, um, has come back on the back of an invitation to give a master class, which I also seldom do, um, which has arrived on the back of an invitation to co-edit an issue of Griffith Review, which I've never done. Um, and uh, why am I telling you this? Somebody very famous, or, or perhaps it was a taxi driver, um, uh, said that we're only ever three steps away from disaster. Um, so I hope tonight isn't, isn't. But, uh, but anyway, um, I suppose bearing in mind um, the masterclass tomorrow, I thought it would be interesting to address this notion of what to write. Um, and in particular, um, it's often non-writers who always tell us what to write and they often tell us we should write what we know. Um, I couldn't um, disagree more strongly. Um, to write what you know kind of closes off the imaginative possibilities. Um, the other thing is, uh, it seems to me... Um, Often I'm asked um, why I write, and I, I think I give a slightly um, false answer. I usually talk about the, mar uh, the magic of language to, to conjure up story, and I talk about the enchantment of story and how seductive it is and how wonderful it is to, to make something out of language. But the truth of it is, I think um, what sits behind that is a, is a singular act of self-assertion. Now, in a moment, I'm actually going to read a piece. It's about 10 minutes long. It's a piece on Antarctica, that great blank sheet we see in our imagination. Now, my Antarctica is not to be found in a scientific journal or in the features section of a newspaper. 
I've actually been to Antarctica, and I've written about it in a conventional way, which is to say in a way that would be instantly recognisable by everyone sitting in this room. You've seen the photographs, heard the stories, perhaps seen Antarctica on television, and therefore my conventional piece of journalism would reinforce what is already known and add pointlessly, in my view, to the pile of conventional knowledge. My piece would be likely praised for its veracity, even by those who have never been to Antarctica. But in the end, it would be nothing more than an act of collaboration with the received images filed into this place known as Antarctica. So what else might I write? What else might I say about this place? The answer, of course, is an internalised landscape. And such a place is made up of other places and experiences. So to give you an idea of what I mean uh, by making up place from what it is not, I'll read you this piece. It's called The Road to the South Pole. And incidentally, as unlikely as it sounds, um, there is a road. A, a few years ago, um, the Americans decided that it was too expensive to fly fuel to the South Pole. So they decided to build a road, one of the last great roads unifying the, the edge with the centre. And they built the road using explosives and these, these massive snow ploughs. So for the purposes of identification in this piece, the narrator is one of the road workers. What was that? Oh. It's, it's, it's very thoughtful how they think of these things. Incredible. Okay, so Antarctica, my Antarctica. Here it is so white. It is so still and silent. Why, it is beautiful. We move on and before long stop again to admire the view. It does not appear to have changed. It is still white. It is astonishingly white. It is so still, so still. So amazingly still and so white. The sky is so blue. Everything is soft and white and blue. We move on and soon we stop, as before, to look around at the astonishing whiteness. It is white, white, white piled onto white. It is so white. The white paint on the timber cottage 1,500 kilometres north of here is only thinly representative, a foreign consul in a two-bit state. This is white. This is white, white. All the furnishings are white. The welcoming mat is white. South has never looked so white. Eternity is white and blue. A hillside of bright green grass is a science fiction. Popcorn is ludicrous. Ballroom dancing, however, would not be out of place down here. Nor the slow glacial accruements of a pension scheme. Talk of insurance has surprising avidity here. Most other things are eccentricities. A black umbrella, for example. Cats as pets. Carpet. Caged birds. Purple is unheard of, by the way. Yellow is comparatively new, introduced by pissing humans. Otherwise, the fidelity shown towards white is breathtaking. Of course, White is all it knows, and it has worked hard to build a world out of white. Of its prejudices, there are a few, quite a few actually. There remains an urgent need for a persuasive voice to make the case for horse racing. Submarines are loathed as, as sly cheating devices. Chewing gum is a vile practice. Chimney smoke and exhaust fumes are bewildering varieties of abuse, scarcely believable. Conceptually, the idea of a hedge is interesting, but beside the point. Scissors are also interesting, but a puzzle. Dogs are fun. Dogs are beloved, and they're very welcome. In this white, white world, a dog's pink tongue is astonishing. Military parades fail to reward attention. 
A salute is extremely theatrical. A wheel-drawn cart is another interesting but imperfect concept. In this white, white world, we learn to yield to particular memories and desires. A blow heater, for example, or an oil heater, or an open fire. Duty is understood. Duty to whiteness is rigorously upheld. Duty, of course, is rarely straightforward. Duty killed Scott. Why did he not jettison those rock samples instead of hauling them all the way to the final camp? More generally, duty is not a word deserving of scorn. Whisper duty, and the white plains and the white sides of Mount Misery suddenly look attentive. About now, you may remember an old western. In McKenna's gold, shown at the Woburn Theatre and seen by this road worker in 1965, the Indians suddenly lined the walls of the canyon. Advance anyway. In this way, the new world draws in the old. The duty of this place is to be white, and as white as possible, and for the sky to be blue, as blue as possible, and with a few passing exceptions, it always returns to the beginning, which is this astonishing white. A tropical parrot will never fly across this white plain. The roar of a boxing crowd will never be heard. An arsenal shirt means nothing. A headline about a poor cricket umpire's decision will pass without comment. So will any old howler, for that matter. Reputations matter even less. A fallen hero can walk here safe in the knowledge that he passes by without judgment. The agony straining the smile on the face of the losing contestant at the Miss Universe beauty pageant are just as riveting here as elsewhere. At the same time, this white world knows next to nothing about the impulse or need to charm. Though at times it almost appears that the usually austere and lofty aspect of Mount Terra is just a bit interested in a smile. A gust of wind shifts. The gust is white. The gust lands on more white. And just then it is strikingly obvious, as it has never quite been, that Highland dancing is ridiculous. <laughs> Barbara Streisand oddly is not out of place. Though the respectful hush of snow prefers the gloved hands of Glen Gould, a piano note may be heard for miles. With the sound off, how silly the Rolling Stones appear. Though the Beatles not so. I had not considered the word melancholic until now, but that old hula hoop has no place here either. It is what you bring with you. It is what you bring with you as well as what you pack and offload. Shackleton brought a motor car, the first scene down here. A suitcase is understandable. A container is grotesque. Indians aren't seen much around these parts, or Egyptians, or Samoan rappers. Flax is just one of a pile of words that struggle for meaning. Laughter, jokes. Both are appreciated, especially snow jokes and jokes about getting lost and ending up in the suies or some other made up place. The laughter dies and the white, white, white world is still here like some endless hospital corridor whose end cannot be found. It is so extraordinarily white down here that poor design, poor intent is smelt a mile away. Desire leaves its grubby marks. Presumption, ambition, utility. The same words slapped down on the first road from Roman Gaul to Britain. Puppetry finds a natural home here. Look, a man pulls on his socks. Look, a man brushes his teeth. The man looks up, toothbrush in hand. The vigilance never ends. We will walk on. There is no end of white for company. I saw Yoko Ono before, her black hair just whooshed up before me. 
it was astonishing because everything is white, and then this black flourish. Of course, it wasn't Yoko or even a crow. There are no crows down here. I had been rubbing my eyes against the insistence of everything being white when half a dozen Yoka Onos drew their black wings. I was mistaken, of course, and what I see before me now is correct. A tender regard is shown wet feet. Hot soup might well have been invented here, and gloves dreamt up long before they appeared. Stop and take a moment to look at all this white heaped into pile a pile upon white. There are a few other places on the planet that look the same now as it did when the Romans built a road across Europe. But there is a problem with this astonishing white world. The problem is that it is what it is. And that is a shame because it would be better if it could be more flat more accommodating. So with the help of friendly explosives, we fill the crevices with snow and ice as we craft our way towards the pole. I once saw on television open heart surgery on a Chinese man who remained conscious throughout the operation, thanks to the mysteries of acupuncture. As we uncork our explosives, another image comes to mind. It is my 11th birthday and I have just been handed a beautifully illustrated edition of Gulliver's Travels. There on the cover is a picture of Gulliver. He is so immense he takes up the entire cover, laid out as he is, corner to corner, like a drunk in recovery position, and tied down every part of him, his arms, hands, legs, feet. However, the base of his head is raised so that the chin touches his chest, similar to the Chinese patient I saw receiving open heart surgery. What I am getting at here is that like the surgeon, we also have a job to do. That like the surgeon, we are being watched. And like Gulliver, our patient is unable to lift a finger against our intent. This white world would be astonished to learn that cold can cause trees to explode. The impediment to its grasp of that knowledge is the preposterous idea of a tree. The Sioux and the Cree named the first moon of the year as the moon of the exploding tree. You might as well yell that information at the top of your lungs to a hall filled with village idiots. It is so difficult to say anything of a place that is so holy and purely of itself. So we carry on, as we do, in the direction of south with our sticks of gelignite. You keep feeling as though you have arrived, but you have only arrived at where you set off for, which, as it turns out, appears to be very similar to where you set off from. And now you must push on for the place ahead, which, surely will be very like the previous place. In this way, ice miles are traversed slowly and diligently and in mistaken belief after mistaken belief. So that's my Antarctica. Thank you. I once um, heard Seamus uh, Heaney describe the value of being read aloud to. Actually, I was at a reading, I was doing a reading with him in um, County Clare, or it might have been County, uh, one of those, Ireland anyway. It was <laughs> anyway, he, he is, as is Mont, he's, um, he has beautiful things to say about writing and reading. And he, he described, um, he, he described that the words of the spoke, spoken voice enter one ear, and by the time they've moved out the other, we've made the, those words our own. And in this way, I think the world of story is absorbed and remade. As readers, we make friends with people who exist only on paper, and yet they enter our lives with heart and voice and enjoy a greater radiance than, say, Uncle Tony, whom we only see at Christmas. We're told that as installments of Dickens, the old curiosity shop, we're born across the Atlantic. Crowds gathered at the wharf in New York. And as the ship approached, the crowd on the wharf cried out to the passengers on the deck, is little Nil still alive? 
This close identifying with the character continues, and indeed quality HBO TV shows such as The Sopranos and The Wire offer the same long-running episodic engagement that the 19th century novel offered its readers. Television does it so well, in fact, that it's worth asking the question, what can the novel achieve that TV cannot? Perhaps it's no coincidence that around the time the camera and moving image came into the world, the writer went deeper into himself. The stream of consciousness employed by James Joyce effectively slowed down time, and importantly slowed down time in a way that the camera cannot achieve without severely challenging the viewer's patience. On the face of it, the question what to write is so banal as to seem obvious. There is, after all, an abundance of things to write about. War, famine, the neighbor's feud with the family of the daughter's boyfriend. We give names to these categories, drama, tragedy, farce, comedy. But identifying all the clothes in the world doesn't help us one bit with a decision as to what to wear. And so it is with the question of what to write. But I have an anecdote that will help to refine the question. Samuel Beckett was once a, a secretary to James Joyce and he, he was asked by journalists, Mr Beckett, can you please tell us what Mr Joyce is writing about? Beckett replied, Mr Joyce is not writing about something, rather Mr Joyce is writing something. The shift of emphasis is enormous and of course gathers around the word about. About only leads to what sits before our eye. It is the still life, a bowl of fruit, beloved of every art student and amateur painter. Still life that is endlessly replicated on TV shows such as Days of Our Lives and Coronation Street and regrettably in our era on what passes for the news. Beckett's reply goes right to the heart of how literature is written. It begins, that is, the act of writing, begins as a speculative act. One is writing to discover what it is one will write. I remember the intoxicating moment I first took pen to paper and wrote a sentence that seemed to come out of nowhere. Nowhere in those days being the uncharted realm of the subconscious. I had written a sentence that seemed to have no intent other than its own existence. I was as transfixed as the toddler who from the distance of his high chair reaches over to make a finger mark on the wall. An impulse perhaps similar to the one that inspired early man to dab a stick in charcoal and draw an antelope onto the fire-lit sides of his cave. Surely the message is, put simply, here I am in relation to all things seen. The first character I ever created was a man called Eckstein, Steen, not Stein. While Stein is the more obvious choice, such a name lay outside my life experience. Stein, with all its Jewish associations, didn't ever come into contact with my predominantly Anglo and provincial branch of brick and frontier society at the bottom of the Pacific. Eckstein was a photographer. He took photos of street life, he saw, but he did not feel. He could only respond to the things around him with a descriptive lens. I had no interest in photography at that time. I didn't know a single photographer. There was no one, no one like Eckstein in my life. So where did he spring from? All these years later, he is less of a mystery. The imperfectly named Eckstein, with all his marginalized interaction with the world, was a stand-in for me. At the time of Eckstein's arrival into the world, I was traveling through the US on a greyhound. At night I slept in seedy rooms of once stately hotels since passed into ruin, inhabited by marginalized life, the elderly, the mad and the bad. I kept my distance, I locked the door and waited for morning to break whereupon I lit out for another city on the greyhound. Like Eckstein, I was seeing a lot, but seeing is not the same as discovering or uncovering. Seeing is not the same as feeling. 
To gaze out a bus window at the inner city neighbourhoods of Philadelphia is not the same experience as walking through it. I might as well have sat through a long movie. At the time I unpacked Eckstein, I happened to be living in a DOS house decoratively named the State Hotel, next to the courthouse with its white Doric columns on State Street, Schenectady in upstate New York, home to General Motors Turbine Plant, Union College, and the inspiration for the aliens' sci-fi they came to Schenectady. These were happy and exciting days for me. I barely noticed the fact I was living in a holding pen for the crazed and the aged remnants of America's disposable population. I was too busy playing Dr. Frankenstein to the monomaniacal figure of Eckstein. I could have written a book, well, I could have written about those aged faces lined up in chairs and in neat rows facing the big window of the state hotel like passengers lined up on deck chairs on a cruise ship. At night, they crept like mice back to their tiny rooms. They never locked their doors because as the hotel receptionist explained to me, they don't like dying alone. I could have written about this human detritus, but the truth is I hardly noticed them. They seemed less compelling than Eckstein, who had flared up into my life with the immediacy of an intimate. I wrote in longhand, and I wrote at a furious rate. I filled waste paper baskets in my room, shoved the overflow into plastic bags, and witnessing the outflow of paper from my top floor room, the receptionist assumed a different scenario. One afternoon, she caught up with me in the lobby, and she said, sweetheart, if you ever need someone to write to, you can always write to me. <laughs> I wish I'd taken that advice because it would be years before I caught up with the wisdom of what she said, unintentionally, of course, when I read in a piece by Pico Iyer that prose should have the intimacy of a letter. The reader should feel that they are being singularly addressed, brought into proximity as intimates and confidence. You know that intimacy when you hear your bedmate whispering in his or her sleep. You drift across to their side of the bed and place your ear above their murmuring lips. You are hoping to hear something pure and unmediated directly from the mind, the mind face of the soul. You do it, I know, because that's what I do. Anyway, this, uh, this period with Eckstein was about to draw to a sudden and unexpected end. It arrived with the abrupt heartlessness of a Dear John letter. I'd discovered a very good bookshop near Union College, and there one afternoon I picked up Sol Bellow's Humboldt Guff. I don't know if anyone here has read that it's a wonderful, wonderful novel. Of course, I'd never heard of Sol Bellow or of the novel. I should say that this was in the late 70s. I could hardly walk or talk. <laughs> Given the possibilities a bookshop offers, I could have picked up anything at all. I could have picked up They Came to Schenectady, in which case my time with Eckstein might have continued. Fortunately, I reached for Billow. I opened the book at a random page and began to read. I've since learnt that Humboldt's gift sparked into life after a voice from childhood rang through Billow's head. It was, have I got a deal for you? It wouldn't leave him alone, and around that, around that one line, the bigger world of his old neighbourhood of Southside Chicago came alive. In the bookshop, as I dipped into its pages, I saw that everything that was ma magnificently right about Billow's writing was spectacularly absent from my own. Here was life. Here was emotional truth. Here were the, the tastes and smells and sounds of life. And it all came packaged in something called language. I had been writing compulsively. Now I read compulsively. The need to read Humboldt's gift completely overrode any desire to carry on with Eckstein. He was a cardboard cutout, a fake, a photocopier of experience and completely uninhabited and I was a moron for thinking he was a creation of genius. But I was 28. You didn't laugh then, maybe I should take that down to <laughs> 24, I was 24. Yeah, forgivable. I couldn't yet say that I'd found a voice, but I'd found a game. 
Finding a voice, Seamus Heaney tells us, it means that you can get your feeling into your own words and that your words have the feel of you about them. The voice the writer hears is the ideal speaker of the lines he is making up. The excitement of putting words down on paper was different from any other I'd ever written. This was not a school essay, it wasn't a newspaper story. These words, which as I say, seem to have come out of nowhere, were not about anything in particular, but were growing in startling and surprising ways into story, but also just like the drawing of the antelope established my own existence in relation to all things seen and experienced. I found myself writing about a dairy. It would be years before I moved away from writing about things in the Beckett sense and began to write something, which I was to discover comes from a place within, and that whatever I wrote after was in response to some kind of internal map. What the writer has at his disposal that TV and film doesn't is language. A language that is highly personalised and contains within its words a singularly unique position in relation to all things. Language takes the writer and reader into places that a camera cannot see into. By contrast, TV and film essentially deliver product. Verifiable story. So does much of the pub most of the publishing we see today. Literature delivers something more unique, a language that lights up the interior life of the writer. What makes us unique in the world is our voice, and it's remarkable that we could all be so very different. Each of us carries some interior map of the world. Every so often, a writer manages to raise a piece of that world to the surface and we marvel at something which we never knew to exist, but even more extraordinarily, immediately recognise it for what it is. In his novel, Gifted, this is a, a New Zealand novel, in his novel, Gifted, Patrick Evans tracks the diverging paths of two great New Zealand writers, Frank Sargison and Janet Frame. The young Janet Frame comes to live in a shed on Frank's property on Auckland's North Shore in the 1960s, Frank has consciously set about forging a New Zealand vernacular. His realist stories slide about the surface of New Zealand life. Frame, who will write Owls Do Cry in Frank's garden shed, is well on her way to coming up with a, a radically different strategy. She is intent on remaking the world through language. Gifted skillfully outlines this fault line, and at a telling moment in the novel, Sargison recognises through his young protégé that he has spent his entire life chasing false gold. All that easy story stuff lying about the surface. Frame will go on to remake the world on the back of restocking the common language with the particulars of her own interior life. There's a story, um, a short story called Reservoir, which provides a, a really good illustration of this. And we all know what the word reservoir means. It's a catchment for rain, sun, reflected cloud. It exists in the physical sense. There it is in the photo, or as it is, glimpsed from the car window. In both the photo and the car window, it appears to be autonomous, but unknowable. When Janet Frame describes her reservoir, she takes occupancy of it. And I'll read this from Reservoir. The reservoir was at the end of the world. Beyond it, you felt were paddocks of thorns, strange cattle, strange farms, legendary people whom we would never know or recognise if they walked among us on a Friday night downtown when we went to follow the boys and listen to the Salvation Army band and buy a milkshake and then return home to find that everything was right and safe, that our mother had not run away and caught the night train to the North Island, that our father had not shot himself worrying over the bills, but had in fact been downtown himself and bought the usual Friday night treat, a bag of liquish all sorts and a bag of chocolate ruffs from Woolworths. Here then is Frame's own catchment of fears, excitements, constituency, all appended to the idea of reservoir and brilliantly cleaved to the one sentence. 
Here is place in a generic sense made personal. As readers, we believe in that place because language has made it real. And here's Seamus Heaney again talking about another Irish writer, Pat Kavanagh. When he writes about places now, they are luminous spaces within his own mind. They've been evacuated of their status as background, as documentary, uh, documentary geography, and exist instead as transfigured images on sites where the mind projects its own force. The topic that preoccupies writers, says the Israeli novelist David Grossman, is freedom. Freedom. It is the soul of literature, he believes. Freedom to see things differently. And that includes seeing the enemy differently. Literature closes the gaps in our ignorance and prejudices and restores human dignity to our battered minds and hearts. For a writer, freedom involves an act of magic. It requires a leave of self to take up occupancy in another whose profile is sketchy, but through language steadily comes into focus. Although the extent to which the writer ever completely leaves himself behind is debatable. I feel Kafka was on the money when he observed that the he or she is the walking dream of I. Finally, if we tell ourselves we are writing a novel, or a poem, or an essay, our words are coerced or led into conventional form. In other words, we simply get the world that the world is used to seeing. It is recognised and ticked off accordingly. Novels, memoir, young adult, non-fiction, whatever that means, are publishing industry categories designed to get product to market. Along the way, something is lost. Some wonderful, insightful use of language that might have led to new realities instead has surrendered to industry form. I'm not suggesting that we abandon form. Shape and form satisfies our need for order. And perhaps, but perhaps what is needed are new shapes and forms. We might reflect on the lead provided by the Swiss-German writer Martin Walser. Bowser was best known for his novels, The Assistant and The Tanners, but he also left behind another literary legacy, which was not discovered until after he died in 1956. These were microscripts, thought to have been written in code, but in fact, on closer examination, these ant-like markings revealed a mesh of tiny vertical letters, no higher than one to two millimetres, cramped into the margins of whatever paper was near to hand the back of a postage stamp, the back of an envelope, the back of a business card. Whatever scrap he wrote on imposed its own form. And no story, for want of a better word, was left dangling for want of space. A torn off scrap of paper contained an exact measure of words. In a letter to his editor, he explains a small crisis that sits behind the strategy. He speaks of a pen's stifling effect on him and of a cramping, and how resorting to a pencil and this microscript liberated him back into the area of play. Holding a pencil made him feel like a boy again and free to write anything. A reviewer of Vols's microscripts described the writer's handwriting becoming smaller and smaller and more cramped into the margins of printed pages and the backs of envelopes as he became a more marginalized figure moving to smaller and smaller dwelling places until his final abode in an asylum. It's been observed of Velza that he managed to write about nothing in particular, but these exercises in nothing in particular are exalted and hypnotic to read. Their mental topsy and turving manage that most difficult of feats, which is to catch the gear shifts of how we actually think. His stories drop off a cliff face. Thoughts end mid-sentence, but it would be wrong to suggest that these, are built, that these are building projects that have run out of sustenance and will. The question of what to write is not a question that ever appears to have delayed Walser. He wrote as others breathe, and then he stopped. Although not when he died, but in an asylum. Asked 
the question, what was he writing, or indeed, is he writing anything? He replied, I'm not here to write, I'm here to be insane. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Lloyd. That was absolutely fascinating. Just I hope so. Really, <laughs> very interesting. Um, I'm interested in this, this challenge that you talk about in terms of getting to the emotional resonance of what it is that's, you know, that's there on the page. In, in your own writing, I mean, maybe the, that Antarctic thing is, a, is, a, is, is the piece to talk, to talk back to. I mean, is it the... You're tapping into something that you that you are feeling that that is deriving your writing, or do you? Is what's the process that pulls the two bits together in a sense mm. to to make something? Well, um, as I said, I was down there and I took notes and I looked at this place called Antarctica, mm. and um, but all that I saw is what a camera would see. Mm. And particularly, um, you know, because it is a dangerous place, so there's a sense of always being... Um, you, all, you, you always have a guide, of course. So I, should, I should explain that this is part of a, um, an arts program that Antarctica New Zealand um, operated for a number of years. Each year they would take two artists down there. Um, and you always had an escort. But there was this feeling that you were stepping into the footprints of somebody else all the time, mm -hmm. that where I happen to be standing... Bill Manhauer had stood last year and, and then the year before him a photographer and the year before him a, a visual artist of some kind. And um, so we were going from one sort of viewing platform to the other, still beautiful and all that kind of thing. But, um, it, 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 I, I, you know, um, you are obliged when you stare something in the face like that, you feel a fidelity to be true to what the eye sees, which is different from what the imagination is able to grasp. Mm -hmm. So I think when you close your eyes and get into a playful, sta uh, a playful state, um, and when you bring things into association, you create a place that's made up of other places. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, that's what, and, I, and I feel that that Antarctica I read out now mm -hmm. is... Um, more interesting, mm. at the very least, more interesting mm. than any other um, Antarctica that I've managed to write. Mm. And so that process in your own in your own your own head occurs over over a time. I mean, by giving yourself the space to have absorbed what giving, you've giving seen. Giving yourself permission, to, yeah. uh, I think. Mm. Giving yourself permission mm. to let's see what will happen. Mm. You know. Uh, and, and so is that is that sort of standard in the way that you've approached your your big books? I mean, you know, let's say that. Well, I mean, well, actually, the, the history of silence. Um, I mean, that that bubbling up that happens in the liquefaction and so on, and the layers that come out through through the Christchurch earthquake, which is you know is what you then unpick in terms of your own story, uh, your your family, and so on in, mm. in that memoir. Um, they're all happening emotionally in your. They're all happening in your head. How 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 is that process of synthesising them into into a text? How do you do that? With great difficulty. <laughs> but when you are, you know you're on song. You know you've done it. Yeah. Um, yes. Um, well, this was a, a memoir I wrote um, uh, um, in 2011, and I never ever intended to write a memoir because it seemed to contravene some of the things we're talking about right now. I, I would have to show fidelity to the life that was lived, which is not particularly interesting. But um, when, I, when I went down to Christchurch following this earthquake, um, and to see a place... Is anyone from Christchurch, by the way? Oh, yeah. Were you there for the earthquake at all? Um, OK. Well, um, it's rather shocking. Um, a, a, a catastrophic. Um, to see a place just torn open like that. And suddenly the foundations of this place are visceral. They, the foundations actually have a smell and liquefaction, as you just talked about. And, um, and on the basis of that, um, I began to consider my own foundations. I began to think of my own constituency. What am I made of? 
Uh, and I'd never given a single thought to that in my life, but mm. one thing led me to the other, mm. and then the memoir uh, fuses these, these, these two things together. Mm. But to answer your question, the earthquake provided me with a language mm. um, in, in, in terms of the abandonment of things, mm. the, the, sudden, the suddenness. Um, uh, yeah, it, it, it led me back, I mm. suppose. Mm. But you'd had no anticipation of that when you... No. Uh, yeah. No, no, that's the best, mm. best thing. In mm. fact, uh, you know, being a, being a, a novelist, um, I suppose um, <laughs> you, are, you tend to be slightly opportunistic. Um, I, I was, um, however ridiculous this will sound, I was having a haircut and, um, <laughs> in, 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 in Wellington. And the, the young thing circling me with her scissors, <laughs> and she charged. <laughs> uh, she talked about her, her aunt, um, who, who um, had a broken leg before the earthquake, and, and her leg was in, in, in plaster. And after the earthquake, because um, of the liquefaction, you know, the whole house was, had subsided and the bathroom was inoperable. So her husband, in a great act of husbandly love, went out and dug a hole in the backyard and then uh, borrowed a beach chair and with a pair of scissors cut a hole in the seat of the, the beach chair and placed the beach chair over the hole. And snip, 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 you know. <laughs> um, and I thought, what a wonderful story that is. And, and uh, I must, next, when I'm in Christchurch, I must go looking for that, that a, a, a sort of a, a street where such a thing like yeah. that might have happened. Yeah. Yeah. So I actually went down there with impure mm -hmm. intentions, novelistic intentions, mm -hmm. mercenary yeah, intentions. Yeah, yeah. Um, but quite unexpectedly, uh, it was turned towards my own, mm. my own story, mm. my, own fa my family's story, mm. yeah. Mm. It's interesting, maybe the hairdresser had a bit of this tapping into the subconscious, as you say, in terms of the circularity of the, uh, yeah. <laughs> the description. Mm. So that's, that's very interesting. I mean, I think that um, when, when I think about the process that, for instance, that we've gone through in putting together this Pacific Highways collection, um, about how place can make sense in ways that go beyond the beyond the obvious, um, and one of the things that really struck me as you know you, we were getting the pieces in and, and talking th with you about the uh, the writing for Pacific Highways was how it was trying by the by the layering and the combination of the of the essays and memoirs and stories and so on. Sorry to fall into the publishing industry trap of categorisation, but the different styles of writing that, that we had, um, that it actually took you to an emotional an emotional engagement with New Zealand that went well beyond the sort of the factual data which we got, mm. which was gathered, but well beyond the sort of cliched sort of shorthand that we'd become very accustomed to. Um, yes, yeah, um, it was a happy accident, really. Um, something was achieved in this particular volume that you hope for, but it, 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 there's a bit of magic that happens when, when, when all these pieces sort of rub shoulders with each other. I think it's because we, we are so used to um, hearing um, just um, places described in terms of cliché, mm. you know, um, Australia, the Opera House, Kangaroos, mm. Italy, Pasta, New Zealand, All Blacks, Earthquakes, mm. and so on, and we, we fail to really you know, uh, engage very, very deeply with the place. The other thing is, um, what I had to think about before we, we set about coming up with this notion is, what is New Zealand? Does it even exist? And I mean it quite sincerely. Uh, I, I mean, it's just like any country, it's a completely made up place. Australia is made up. We, we, we live in these fictional places, really. Mm -hmm. And we foist these sorts of national identities onto innocent trees and mountains and things. <laughs> you're, you're ours now. <laughs> so, um, so, and then the next thing is to think about, well, who, is, who has the privilege mm. to say what this place is all about? Mm. Uh, that seems important. And it seems to me that... Um, if I was a geologist rather than a writer, perhaps, and, and invited to, you know, co-edit this, I perhaps would have produced a different New Zealand. Mm -hmm. Or if I was an anthropologist, or if I was a factory worker, or whatever. There are four and a half million New Zealands. Mm -hmm. um, but beyond that, um, 
I think the starting point was to look at the population, at the changing demographic, and the fact that the world has finally arrived in New, Ze New Zealand. We look like the world now. And to, to, to work from that point back outwards, um, you know, um, Auckland, for example, is, is one of the most cosmopolitan cities uh, in, in the South Pacific now. now that, that's happened in the course of 10 years. Rather extraordinary. And the other thing to think about was, well, when I was growing up in a fairly Anglo monocultural society, our reference points were, you know, Australian cities and London, of course, and the rest of the world didn't exist. Africa didn't exist. No one had heard of it. No one had heard of According to our newspapers, South America didn't exist. You know, um, and so, but that's changed. Now there are Peruvians living in there, there are Chileans, there, everybody is there. So what are the social and cultural implications? They're really interesting. Our cultural reference points are going to change as accordingly. The Asian community is the fastest growing community in New Zealand. It's going to be fascinating to be in New Zealand in, a, in another generation because people will speak of Shanghai in the way that people in my generation perhaps spoke of New York and, and London. So I think place is, it's hard to be fixed, pinned down in time. It's forever um, redefining itself. Um, of course it is. It's a, it's a dynamic thing, isn't it? It's a dynamic mix. Um, yeah. It's interesting, I mean, because it, the, one, one, that, that idea of trying to get to the emotional resonance of whatever the subject is, I mean, it's very much a part of what, 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 what we try to do with Griffith's Review, you know, so we choose a topic and we've got the sort of factual pieces, we've got the analytical pieces, we've got the memoirs, we've got the fiction and so on, but the idea of it is to take you to somewhere else which is beyond the sort of obvious stuff that's on the surface. And, and I think in many ways, and it works so beautifully in this, in this particular collection, is that you get that layering of different voices that sort of, I mean, talking of the, the liquefaction stuff, I mean, it's sort of like they bubble up through each other and, and permeate. Um, and it's in that sort of layering that, that you unleash some of that emotional um, depth, I think. Yeah, I mean, they do speak to each other, not quite deliberately, but the echoes of things said earlier in the book carry through um, to, to, you know, yeah. It's almost like that notion of four voices, you get four voices together and they create a fifth voice. Well, it's similar, I think, with all these different voices in this book has created another layer that you're talking about. Yeah. Um, but um, wouldn't it be interesting um, in 10 years' time to, to repeat the exercise and a whole other place would emerge, you know, a different place. Mm -hmm. So in your own writing, I mean, being open to those possibilities, um, um, th that must be an exciting sort of thing because you don't quite know where it's going to go. No, you don't. And um, that's the interesting thing about being a writer, um, how you are in the world, how you engage with it. The world changes, you're changing, the engagements shift all the time. Yeah, no, and, and, and of course the other thing that writers respond to is not just the world around them, it's literature, you know. I mean, I, it's always contentious, in my view, when you talk about writers being Australian writers or New Zealand writers and so forth, the fact of the matter is what has made them is the world of literature. Um, you know, um, I, I deliberately seek out translated fiction whenever I can. Um, um, Probably, I'm trying to, at the moment I try and think of some names that completely vanish, but I'll make somebody up. Uh, <laughs> that guy. You're, who, you're a novelist. <laughs> that guy in Germany has probably had more impact on me than yeah. th this other, than Catherine Mansfield. Mm, mm. One's a New Zealand, the, the other's German, mm. you know. Am I a New Zealand German mm. writer? You know? Um, no, I don't know that we've got, have we got microphones for doing any questions? Oh yes, we have, good. I've, I'm sure that there'll be people who want to ask you some questions, so why don't we, be, has anyone got a question they'd like to ask? We've got microphones coming down on the sides. Yes, there's one here, a lady in... Only one so I can answer. <laughs> do, so do, do, does the, the feedback from readers make much of an impact in, in, in your own writing or in thinking about what you do next or is it just sort no, of, no, no. it's just sort of, it's just part of the wash that happens yeah, as part yeah, of the process? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry, that's a not 
if okay. somebody comes up to me and says, I really liked your book, and they stand there smiling, I have, n I, you know, I want to throw myself off a bridge. A a Just a warning in case. A, fr <laughs> a, 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 fr a friend of mine who will remain nameless has a great party trick because people come up to him and say, oh, look, you know, it must be great being a novelist. And he says, oh, yeah. He said, uh, they said, I've always wanted to be a novelist, and I've got a book that I'd write to like. And he said, oh, right. He said, and what do you do? I'm, I'm a brain surgeon. And they said, oh, I've always wanted to be a brain surgeon. <laughs> Would it be possible for me to have a go one day? Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so. uh, I'm in your masterclass tomorrow, and I want to say thank you already for so much fantastic um, stimulation. And, and um, the, I, the question I have to ask is um, about playfulness. Is about um, what, sorry? Playfulness. Oh, yes. Yeah. Because yeah. I can see that in you, you know, you've got lots of um, fun about how you use language and, and you see things in, in quite bizarre ways at times. So, given that you have referred to this very monoculture background of yours, how did this playfulness begin? How did you cultivate it? And why is it still so uh, nurturing for you? Well, it helps uh, that I was an idiot. Um, <laughs> so that kind of frees yourself. I was at school as a complete idiot, uh, in the real sense, you know, IQ sense, and kind of built myself up from that. But yeah, a little bit of that. But um, it's, a, it's a bit what I said before, really. Um, um, you cannot, you cannot, when you sit down to write, you mustn't put any constraints around yourself. You mustn't say, oh, I'm starting, I'm, I'm setting out to write a piece of fiction. Just write, just write, see what happens. And, and the other thing is, anything is okay. Um, and sometimes you have to keep digging and keep digging away until you find the, you know, the real seam of gold. You have to you write pages and pages and pages. But I was saying to Julianne earlier, it's a funny combination of playfulness and intense concentration. And it's a very difficult, really, to hold those two contradictory things in, 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 in hand. Very hard, very tiring. The other thing is, um, when you write, I think it's quite important. Um, and it's, I don't think it's any accident that most writers like to write first thing in the morning. Um, Toni Morrison, for example, uh, she has said she she will, she she writes at 4 a.m. when she's not quite awake, but neither is she asleep. And so that all the doors and between consciousness and subconsciousness are swinging open, and um, things happen because you happen to be writing at at that particular time. You're a bit dreamy. The other thing I would say is, don't look at what you write. Listen. You know. Um, close your eyes, don't even worry about, certainly don't worry about grammar, but just you're listening for the voice, that's the thing. That since you've got a, a voice, that's the thing that's going to create the words. Yeah. Yeah, there's a microphone. Uh, I really enjoyed your article, uh, so, sorry, your, your words there on Antarctica. I imagine vis visiting a place like the Antarctic, is so impressive visually that I'm sure you must have written some notes which reflected that visual stimulation, yet you wrote something that was entirely different. Did you actually write something that was somewhat standard first and then went to your alternative, or were you able to just go straight to the alternative? Um, well, you, I, I wrote, yeah, no, I did write a, a sort of an ordinary piece um, um, for um, uh, the Lonely Planet um, anthology of, of, of travel writing and it was um, Cape Evans and it was about the skewers and we we're just the other artist this guy Boyd Webb and I were in this little rock cavity and and there were thousands tens of thousands of, of penguins the Adili penguins all the males do all the nesting the roosting and the males were sitting there and every now and then a, a skewer would just sort of fly into the middle and there'd be a tremendous kerfuffle and the skewer would just sort of look away indifferently and then the, the penguins would forget it was there and then um, you know suddenly there'd be a terrible noise and you sort of see shocking things you saw it 
this particular skewer pick up a baby, um, um, a dilly penguin, and, and it was flying up in the air and trying to gobble it at the same time and realised it couldn't and then came back to land just in front of us, spat it up and the, the chick sort of shook itself happy to be alive and then it was dead and about 0.5 of a second later just it was, was, sh it was picked up by the skewer and shaken until it was sort of unzipped and it's blood. In, in, imagine bl blood in Antarctica is a dramatic effect. Um, so yes, I was quite content to write just as an observer. Um, really, it's just a piece of reportage I wrote, and which is perfectly valid and fine, uh, but a different, a different writing exercise. And yes, I, I, was, um, I was taking lots of notes and things, but I haven't actually used them at all. Um, it seemed to me that the, my imagination created a, a more interesting um, possibility. A pure mm. distillation of it. Well, I don't know. It's a distillation. It was because because it's it's more of a borrowing. Yeah. Um, you know, it was a place made up of other places. Mm. Uh, how can I understand this place? It's by understanding by knowing this other mm. place here. Mm. You know. So, in terms of you were describing earlier that that period of of being in America and 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 travelling and then you know, doing the writing and then coming across the, the, uh, the bellow. Mm. How long was it after you started doing that sort of reading before you found the, the, the voice to enable yourself to free up your writing? Was, there a, was that a process that went on for a long time before it sort of yeah. pulled back? Um, well, it took, <laughs> well, it took me an unusually long time, I think, to understand that what underpins words is voice, you know. You know, when we pick up a book um, at a, in the library or a bookshop and we kind of do that business of opening it, you know, impress me, go on, impress me. What we're, what we're locking onto are not the words at all. It's, it's, the, it's the, 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 the authorial voice underpinning those words. We're being spoken to and it's the question that arises, can we trust this voice? Can we trust this voice? And the moment you see a word or, or a phrase that doesn't work for you, no, I can't trust that voice, you know? Um, so it wasn't until um, the 1980s and I began to read um, people like Raymond Carver, who are all voice, that I began to understand the primacy of voice in, in, in prose. Um, yeah, up until that point, I think I was probably more drawn to a cinematic kind of mm -hmm. prose. Yeah. Interesting. Are there any other questions? Time. I'm being told time. But if there's another question, no. All right. Well, look, I think this has been really fascinating, and, and I'm very grateful that you've put the effort and thought into distilling this because it's a really, uh, it really takes us to another another space in terms of understanding the process and the, and the importance of writing. And, and your work in particular. So I'd like to thank you very much for agreeing to be involved in this. I mean, to, for doing the, for being involved in the Pacific Highways, which really started this whole chain and, and in anticipation for tomorrow. Um, I'd like to thank Arts Queensland for, for funding this um, process of, you're one of the international superstars that they're um, very keen to be touring at the moment. So it's great to- write that down? <laughs> it's great that, that the international superstars extend into, into this world of literature and ideas because I think that's a space which, which often gets forgotten. We see grand names of stage and screen. So it's, it starts back here and it's something deep inside. So thank you very much indeed, Lloyd. And, thank um, you, Julian. Please